Hello, and welcome to the Resilient Life Podcast. Resilient Life is part of peakprosperity.com. It's where we focus on practical and actionable knowledge for building a better future. I'm your host, Adam Taggart. With major hurricanes in our immediate past, present, and future, the topic of how to prepare for a natural disaster is an extremely timely one. The right advanced preparations can literally mean the difference between life and death. And of course, hurricanes aren't the only reasons to prepare for an emergency. As emergencies can be naturally caused, like a flood, tornado, or earthquake, or man-made, such as a financial crisis, social unrest, or war, everyone listening to this podcast has a vested interest in taking steps today to reduce their vulnerability should one of these unfortunate events occur where they live in the future. So to make sense of which steps are the most important to take soonest when preparing for a major disaster, we've invited Matthew Stein back on the program. Matthew is a design engineer, green builder, and author of the two best-selling books, When Disaster Strikes, A Comprehensive Guide to Emergency Planning and Crisis Survival, and When Technology Fails, A Manual for Self-Reliance, Sustainability, and Surviving the Long Emergency. Matthew is a graduate of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, otherwise known as MIT, where he majored in mechanical engineering and was the recipient of the Straight T Award, MIT's highest athletic honor. He has presented his expertise in disaster preparation on numerous radio and television programs and is an active mountain climber, as well as a guide and instructor for blind skiers. Matt, thanks so much for joining us today. We have a lot to dig into. Are you ready? Sure. It's a pleasure to be back on the show with you, Adam. Well, thank you very Always much. great to be on your show. Well, you know, Matt, for those who haven't heard you on the show before, can you give our listeners a little background into how you came to become an expert on emergency preparation? Well, I, I can, came to this kind of from an unusual way. I'd never considered myself to be a survivalist, and uh, I'd been concerned, ecologically concerned with the trends in the planets back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. But back in 1999, I'd been uh, – actually, 1997, I'd been praying and meditating, and uh, which I did on a fairly – on pretty much daily basis, and I generically asked for guidance and inspiration, and I received a pictorial storyboard outline, kind of like a how a director or producer will have people sketch out pictures describing scenes in a movie. So I received an outline for a massive book dumped into my head instantaneously. Now, to be honest with you, it was a huge shock. I'm a mechanical engineer, bachelor of science from MIT. I never considered writing anything remotely like this. And I'd written a few trade journal articles, you know, technical types of things, but nothing like this, and never even thought of writing anything like this. And here I get this project dumped in my lap. But essentially what was sketched out for me was a book to help people live more sustainably and more self-reliantly as our world goes through massive changes and upheavals. And realized that when I received this outline, it was in 97 when uh, the world was going along really great. You know, dot-com was booming. Business in America couldn't be better. Oil was at a 30-year low when you factored in inflation. And it seemed on the surface that, you know, our world was doing just fine. It even looked like the Middle East was going to be resolved peacefully. Uh, it was before the Second Intifada had started. So to receive this semi-apocalyptic project dumped in my lap was, was really a rude shock and rude awakening. But as I did the basic research for my book, I found that the natural systems of our planet that maintain life as we know it, and including our weather systems, our food systems, the the uh, you know the, the systems in the oceans that, that keep keep the oceans healthy, I, I realized that all of these natural systems are being stressed beyond sustainable levels and are headed for collapse if we didn't do something significantly different. And in the 20 years now that have passed since I received this sort of vision, uh, we really haven't done anything to slow down the degradation of these natural systems, and they've actually accelerated and gotten far worse than they were 20 years ago. So time is ticking, and, and the world is still not waking up that we've got to make these changes. So, so that's how I became worried and concerned, and naturally the events of the last 20 years have only added to my level of concern. Mm, well, uh, your perspective meshes 
pretty precisely into the same one that we share here at Peak Prosperity. And uh, and sadly, we agree with you that uh, uh, you know, I think so many of the reasons why you wrote uh, or entered into this uh, this line of work um, are, are only more expressed now as we're further along in the timeline and, and things have only been accelerating. Um, I also should mention too, I'm, I'm looking at my bookshelf here and I'm, I'm seeing what I believe you, you're referring to as your, that, that first major opus of yours, uh, which is uh, When Technology Fails. Uh, and it is a, I can give a personal testament. It has a, a spot of honor here on my bookshelf and has been a very valuable resource for me. Um, so uh, whatever dumped that into your head, I'm very appreciative for it. Well, it, it gave me the outline, but I had to do the work. So it took, it was a three-year project for, for the first edition that published in around Thanksgiving of 2000 and uh, about two years of labor, a year of lost wages. And then I put another year of labor and lost wages into updating in 2008. So what you're seeing there had at one point had more than all the equity of my home into it and <laughs> and three years of my life certainly have been have gone into that and so I, I did the best I could to to put down on paper what what had been shown to me instantaneously in in the in a vision what must be described as as some kind of vision well I think for for I speak for all of us who are owners of that book uh, uh, we're appreciative of the the risk you took the great risk you took to put that out there because uh, yeah, I think you've helped a lot of people with that guidance and uh, and hopefully we're going to help more on this podcast. And, and before I get to talking specifically about uh, hurricanes, um, in my intro, I gave a brief nod to the universal importance of of having a plan and, and supplies uh, put away in advance for emergencies, you know, just in case. Um, but uh, do you care to comment at all at a high level about about the importance of, of preparation in general before we get specifically to hurricanes? Well, I think it's really critical in this time. You know, we just don't know what it's going to be. Whether there's going to be a pandemic, whether there's going to be, you know, somebody, probably Pakistan, a bomb will get sneaked out of there. But you know, an EMP attack on the United States is highly likely. A, a solar storm that wipes out our grid for many months to many years is a, a one in eight chance every decade. The scientists say, and we've got a and it's been nine and a half decades since the last one of that magnitude hit the planet back in 1921. It was only six decades before that to the Carrington event in 1859. So we all, no matter where you live in the country, uh, the scenario of all of a sudden one day not being able to go to Costco and not being able to fill up your car at the gas pump is is an extreme likelihood. We just we just don't know when. You know, it, it's going to happen. Most of us feel like it's going to happen in our lifetimes. And uh, so being prepared and developing a plan and starting small, starting simple, and my newer book, When Disaster Strikes, basically is a really comprehensive survival and prepping guide. So it kind of lays it out in simpler, clearer form than the massive book, When Technology Fails, so that if you really want to want to walk through that and start getting yourself together as far as being prepared, and it, it gives you peace of mind, you know. Uh, preparedness like car insurance. Nobody I knows, nobody I know who has insurance says, "Wow, I'm insured. I want to get in a head-on collision today." It's <laughs> like, you know, if we never use that insurance, great. Okay, so the insurance companies made some money, and we never got to use it. That's that's terrific. You know, you win, right? Right. <laughs> if you don't right. use your insurance, you win. And uh, and. And having the insurance of an emergency plan, a 72-hour survival kit, uh, as you can build up to, to have things that can last you, you know, several months of food stored, and a, and a game plan for long-term collapse if, if you've got the ability to start working on that. You, you know, if that day comes, you'll thank God that you spent the time doing it. And if it never comes, you'll thank God it never came, right? Right. No, exactly. Um you know, it's funny. I, I just read a piece uh, the other week that talked about uh, made the same uh, analogy for preparing uh, as as insurance. And uh, uh, as you said, you know what it gives you is it gives you peace of mind, uh, and and uh, you know you don't have to feel bad if you you never have to use it. In fact, you should you should feel great, as you just said. Um, the other point I made around that is, you, you know, insurance only has value if you buy it before you need it. <laughs> That's right. That's right. In California, I live in earthquake country, and once you have a, a significant earthquake in your area, you can't go out and buy insurance. You can't say, oh, wow, we had a 
5.5 today and you know a bunch of windows broke maybe i'll buy my insurance it's like no it's that's too late you're you're cut off at that point uh, just like uh, hey today i heard that Richard Branson and Donald Trump's giant mansions down in, I think, St. Thomas in the Virgin Islands um, were destroyed. And so rich or poor, it can hit anyone and everybody. Now, naturally, Richard Branson and Donald Trump can much more afford it than you and I can. But, uh, but the, it, you know, disasters, catastrophes uh, – it, they can be great levelers between the rich and the poor, and and it's really who's prepared and who's not prepared matters more. And and just having money does. If you don't put that money to good use ahead of time, it, it doesn't mean you're going to be any more protected than the other guy. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, something else you said just reminded me of a conversation I was having the other day, where um, you know, we could have had the same conversation five years ago, ten years ago, fifteen years ago, um, and we, I'm sure, coming into the conversation would be the the just in time nature of our modern economy um, and way of life where, you know, we have something like, uh, you know, less than a 48 hour supply of, of most key medications, you know, in most towns. And uh, it's, it's not that much longer for food at the grocery store. Um, and uh, you know, it's, it's highly efficient, but it's not very resilient. Um, but uh, over the past five years, you know, we've had the explosion of, uh, really convenient uh, home delivery and, and uh, you know, e-commerce out of the home, um, largely driven by Amazon, where for most people, you know, most of what they buy these days, they buy online and it magically shows up at their house, you know, a couple of days later. And I don't, I don't think we really appreciate now, um, while that's wonderfully convenient, how vulnerable that makes us if we enter into a period where, you know, all of a sudden those, as Chris calls them, the big brown trucks of happiness, you know, just stop showing up <laughs> on your doorsteps. I, I, I like that. I haven't heard that that uh, line before, but I do like that. Yeah, the big brown trucks of happiness. Yeah, yeah but we're, oh, we're, we're just increasingly box. dependent upon that as a distribution of, you know, system for our needs. But it's it's highly disruptable given one of the many different potential disasters you, you listed off earlier. Well, the grocery stores aren't far behind. They They typically work on a three-day turnaround now. So when I was a kid, all of the cities across the country had giant warehouses on the outskirts, and they had pretty much a 30-day supply of critical supplies on hand. And now it's pretty much a three-day supply is what I've heard in, in town. And you're saying it's actually even less. You're saying two days of critical medicines. And so, yeah, it's all coordinated by the Internet, and everything is on trucks. So what you buy on Friday in the store was on a truck coming from somewhere on Monday. And so that system, when it goes down, yeah, it works great when everything's there. But when it's disrupted, then it's really – what you and your friends and neighbors have on your shelves and your cupboard is what is what or what you can forage for in your backyard or your your vicinity is is what you're stuck with for who knows how long some of these scenarios could be months to years i mean i hope that never happens but it uh, it probably will within my lifetime and and maybe sooner rather than later yeah and that's that's actually really sobering because <clears throat> i think probably most people listening to this podcast have you know, been without power um, for, you know, maybe a weekend, um, some maybe a week or a couple of weeks. You know, if you, you live somewhere a little bit more rural after a, a, a big uh, natural event like a, a hurricane or whatnot. But I don't think anybody or I would posit to say very few people listening have ever been without, uh, you know, the modern amenities of, of our current society for more than a month. Um, except by choice, you know, maybe people who right. wanted to go live in a cabin somewhere or, um, uh, you know, uh, go take a remote trip somewhere as, as a life experience. But I don't think any people have lived that type of forced hardship. Uh, so if you see a, a good probability of that happening somewhere in the country in your lifetime, um, that's something that I think we as a, as a modern society is just very unprepared for. You know, something maybe our great, great grandparents you know, maybe experienced on a relatively routine basis in their lives, but it, it would be very, very foreign, I think, to most people in America today. Yeah, I, I have an interesting perspective from my in-laws. My father-in-law grew up in, uh, he was born during World War One, and in Holland, and uh, he was the 13th of 13 children, and his parents were killed in a bombing shortly afterwards. Yeah. 
and so he was raised by a sister. And then in World War II, he was on a border border town with Germany, and so the t- he was a resistance fighter, and he saw everything fall apart and people starve and people dying right and left, and he was captured and tortured. So a very different perspective. They, in, then post-World War II, was all, you know, his neighborhood near where he was was all bombed out, and he ended up in the Indonesian Revolution as a trained Dutch Marine. And my mother-in-law grew up in Indonesia, and uh, – and so she talks about, you know, looking out the back and seeing bodies floating down the river and, and you know, guns. And she was shot through the chest at one point and had a nine day and, and people were starving and they were on rations. So it's a very – people who went through those kinds of times in other countries have a very different perspective as I'm sure the Syrian refugees do in, in today's era and people from – you know, sub-Saharan Africa and places where there's all kinds of conflict. When I see the natural trends in our world are going to bring it home to America, I just don't see how we can avoid it. I think that uh, our wealth and our power will not be able to insulate America from these kinds of shattering um, circumstances as the climate shifts. I think you're just seeing a tip of the iceberg with the current storms that what you're seeing in hurricanes Harvey and Irma, you know, instead of being a once in 500 year storm, they may be a once in five year storm and then they may be an every year kind of storm and that storms that far dwarf them might become, you know, the big storms every five years. I just think that we're going to see the extremes in our planet go off the chart and the number of refugees, eco and war-torn refugees from around the world searching for a place to survive and raise their families in relative peace are just going to overwhelm the countries that aren't totally shattered, will be shattered by the refugees. So it's a, it's an interesting time we live in and, you know, Difficult times often bring out the best in people, and not the, they bring out the worst in some, but they tend to bring out the best in most. That people pull together and, and help each other out, and the kinder, gentler heart uh, shines through. And uh, I think we're going to see an awful lot of those times, and, and a lot of bringing out the best in many and the worst in some. Well, I, I actually really like that, and I want to flag for us to return to that near the end of the, the podcast, if we will, but I, I like that. It, it, it can bring out the worst in some, but it usually brings out the best in most. I really like that, and I think it's a, I think it's correct, and I also just think it's a, a way to look at um, the preparation for some of these disasters that, as you say, are, are, are probably just mathematically inevitable, um, and, and look at them without, you know, with something more than just complete abject fear. <laughs> Um, so with that said, let's let's switch gears now to talking specifically about um, the hurricanes that are battering the U.S. right now. We we just had Harvey in the in the Gulf, and it really did a, a huge number on Houston and parts of uh, parts of Louisiana. Um, but more specifically, I think I'd like to start talking about Irma, which uh, up until a few days ago, I think was was registered as the most powerful hurricane that had formed in the Caribbean, um, or at least entered the Caribbean. Um, I think it's now down from a Cat 5 to a Cat 4, but still a highly powerful and destructive uh, hurricane. And it looks like it's expected to hit Florida sometime Sunday morning. And for the record, folks, it's Friday afternoon as Matt and I are recording this. So these people don't have a lot of time to prepare, Matt, you know, 48 hours uh, from now. And uh, probably most of them won't even hear this podcast until uh, until the storm is hitting or after the storm. Um, but with 48 hours in, in advance of a major disaster at this point, what should those folks be focused, most focused on in terms of prioritizing their actions? Well, if they can't, you know, if they're in a really vulnerable area, then focused on putting supply, getting su- whatever supplies they can into their car and getting out of the area or flying, you know, evacuation is the most important. Say you can't evacuate or you don't feel the need to evacuate, then a really big one is going to be filling while the public water system is still working and still providing clean potable water to fill up your bathtubs, to fill up your sinks, to fill up garbage cans, to fill up anything you can with water. You know That's going to be a big one. Naturally, if you planned ahead, you really want to have the ability to purify water on the fly. You know, a lot of people uh, – 
want to stay hunkered down where they are, but if if they have to leave where they are, if the building they're in is in is breaking up and they have to leave, then they're going to have to leave. So if they can have a backpack ready with critical things, uh, you know, one of the one of the so what you need to think about is a minimum of three days for yourself and your family of food, water, portable shelter, meaning rain gear, protective clothing, whatever you think you need, medicines, everything you need. Think also about critical documents. Um, if you haven't stored documents off-site somewhere, at least copy them onto a flash drive or something you can bring along with you um, in case everything you have is wiped out. Hopefully you've done something like Carbonite, where you're backing up all of your documents online and in the cloud. Um, you know, I, I, things like that, I like to have multiples. I like to have hard copies sent away and shipped away to a friend out of town. I like to have electronic copies stored on site outside of my computer in case, you know, like it burns down or somebody, I come home and find that somebody broke into my house and stole all my stuff. And think about the things you need to put your life back together again if you have to leave everything behind. It's, it, I refer to it, it's been referred to as my life in a box. And I, I adopted that from somebody else, but some of the things is your birth certificates, social security cards, alien cards, copies of driver's licenses, medical and immunization records, marriage certificates, military papers, ownership and registration papers, RVs, cars, etc., living trust, wills, just just the stuff that you if everything went away and you had the box of this stuff, you could maybe put you know a significant portion of your life back together. Uh, so, so you know, hopefully that never happens. But I, I had friends who were in Hurricane Iniki on Hawaii, on Kauai, 175 miles an hour, Super Cat 5. And they were just arrived. It was the beginning of their vacation. You know, it's like good choice of places to go. <laughs> it's like, oh, boy. <laughs> and they were in there for nine hours as that jet engine roar was going. And one lady was just sitting there scrubbing the grout between the tiles in the shower with a toothbrush trying to take her mind off things. And they're watching. They were several rows back from the ocean front. And they watched all of the houses in front of them break up and, and blow by them and float by them. And when it ended, their place was still there. But all those people in the other houses that didn't drown or die, you know, it, or had to had to leave. Their houses were gone. They, they, they were gone. So, you know, if that happens, and I know it's kind of late, but it's if you can get a dry bag for your 72-hour kit, those are like river guide bags. Those are what, they're sort of packs that roll up at, at the top and have kind of a giant paper clip that goes over them. And the river guides use them in whitewater rafting. And they keep everything totally dry in there. And so a dry bag for your 72-hour kit allows you to, you know, wade through the river, use it kind of as a flotation device, sort of like grab onto it like a little floaty barrel and and move if you have to. And, and your stuff inside there will stay dry and not be destroyed. So these are just some of the things to consider. The aftermath is something else to consider is that if when you survive after surviving through the hurricane or the earthquake or disaster it may you know wherever you live it may not always be a hurricane then how do you deal with perhaps weeks perhaps in some cases months where there's no potable water and no sewage systems operating and can you keep yourself healthy under those conditions and can you purify water so that you don't poison yourself with every drink you take uh, so you know these are all significant concerns and things to worry about all right so let's let's get to that aftermath in just a moment here but um so let's say uh the people in irma or i think it looks like about a week after irma we might even get another hurricane hurricane jose which is already formed in the Gulf, but, uh, or formed in the Caribbean, but, um, unclear yet whether it's going to make landfall or go off to sea, but, but assuming it, it does make landfall. Um, when, when the storm is actually there, um, you mentioned a little bit about your, your friend there in the, the Kauai uh, hurricane, but, uh, do you have any tips for people about, uh, what to do to, to ride out the storm in the greatest safety if you couldn't evacuate and, uh, and just have to hunker down? Okay. Well, Definitely fill up 
any containers and bathtubs and things you can with water. Tape off the toilets. Make sure nobody flushes a toilet because there's a couple – you can't drink out of the toilet itself, but the toilet tank has a couple of gallons usually in it of really good water in there. And water's – it was three weeks before water and power were, were restored in Kauai, and it was – you know the authorities. Everything was like overloaded, and the my friend David Ruley, he worked for the public utility district and the water people. So he was very smart about storing a bunch. And a lot of families used the water that he stored in those hours before everything got shut off and broken. Staying away from windows, flying glass, getting all of like lawn furniture, limbs off the trees, anything that might be a lethal Projectile. blowing. Yeah. projectile yes try to try to minimize those projectiles around your home and and then try to be aware that those projectiles if it's 150 mile an hour winds that things will be flying around that can they will certainly go right through windows but can even go through stud walls and that your stud walls if you're not behind a concrete wall that things like wood stud walls um you know may well just go away and uh, and so you have to have a contingency plan if you're in a stud framed home and it's that high of a high of a winds for getting out of there and you know I mean hopefully you're never in that situation but you have to be aware that that might be it you might have to just pick up at, at one moment and go and and look for the nearest safest best next best safest place to be so which, which I'm guessing you'd recommend sort of do your best to predict in advance what that's going to be in other words pick your your location B, if location A suddenly becomes right. unsafe? Yeah, totally, totally correct. Pick your location B, if location A. For example, I had friends in um, Black Friday in Australia. They they were some ski they ski people I knew in Tahoe, and their and their parents were aging, and they decided to leave Tahoe, where they lived for fifteen years, twenty years, and move back to Australia. And it was 118 degrees outside, and a hot wind was blowing, and they, they were, it was super, super dry, and they looked outside. There was no sirens, no warning, and they saw this massive mile-high plume of smoke like right over the hill. So they just grabbed their dogs and their computers and a few you know quick items and threw them in their car and left for a friend's home that had was more defendable than theirs where their friends had more grasslands around them and they had a little pond they had firefighting equipment a little tractor and they spent the night at their friend's place battling the blaze around their friend's place and protecting it until about Five in the morning, they were finally able to get some sleep. Then they went back hoping to see their home, and they got around the corner, and the blaze had been so hot that they had an adobe brick-walled home with a metal roof, and all that remained was one wall. Wow. The metal roof was melted. His bicycle tools, he was a bike mechanic, were melted. And nothing could have – there was no way in, – in that firestorm, 400 people in their town died and, uh, in the area. And people were found incinerated in their cars, and 95 percent of, of his town was burned down. Luckily, he had a coffee roasting company, and like the, the shack the, – the shed that the coffee roaster was in did not – did not burn down, and so they were really – they at least had a way of making a living afterwards. But if that kind of snap decision you may have to make sometime, and, and they made a good decision to pack what they could in 10 minutes and go, and, and uh, that saved their life. And people who were too late making those decisions in their same town, many, many perished. Mm, yeah, and I'm sure that <laughs> – the importance of making that that call is just as important in a in a in a, a fire situation like that or a flood situation. I mean, it's 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 doesn't really matter the disaster itself. There's many different disasters that have the ability to get to a point of criticality. So the important part is is being able to move with swiftness if you've all of a sudden realized that critical point's been hit and to get to a different place. So, um, all right, having a plan B sounds very important. I want to ask you one question back to. Um, 
to where to locate in the house. You had mentioned, you know, try to get into a room that's structurally sound, uh, try to avoid windows. Um, I've heard for a lot of different types of disasters, you want to be in an interior room with as few windows as possible. Um, do you have an opinion on uh, where in the house that room is? In other words, um, I've heard, you know, sometimes find get in the basement if you can. Um, but to your point about being able to leave the house quickly, uh, is, are there also downsides about, about being in a basement that could get suddenly flooded or get, uh, you know, if the house begins to collapse, uh, it m might be hard to get out of the basement. Um, do you have a, a point of view on that? <laughs> this is where the flexibility and the gut feel comes in. And, you know, maybe we'll talk about the pit of the stomach exercise, but it's, it, there is no one rule. Um, certainly in tornadoes, people have survived them by laying down in bathtubs. But of course, I'm telling you to fill your bathtubs with water. <laughs> so after the hurricane, you can use them. Well, you know, it, it, if everything's falling apart around you, if you've got a, a, a good fiberglass stall, you know, or, or a tiled shower where they're, where they put a concrete bed for the tile, then that's probably your safest bet there. You know, that if you've got a good a good shower stall that's got a concrete bed and not just a sheetrock bed around it, then then it, you'd be very protected there. So it's a real judgment call. I mean, basements have typically been the safe places in houses. Richard Branson just weathered the storm with 13 house guests in his concrete bunker style wine cellar while his, you know, big mansion was broken up all around him. So, uh, in his case, the, the basement didn't flood, and they were safe and sound in the basement while you know things were flying through windows and busting up walls up above their head. So, you know, it, it's a judgment call, and and use your judgment and use your gut because sometimes the brain thinks one thing, and there's an I believe that each and every one of us has this inner compass that's been built into it. Call it our spiritual DNA. It's built into us, and the people. In our, our ancestors who didn't have that, well, they got eaten by the saber-toothed tiger or they got the, killed in the battlefield. And, and so natural selection meant that people who had that survived. And so I think it's born and built into each and every one of us. And it can see around the corner and guide you when your brain mind can't make a good decision because it doesn't have the right information on it on hand. And just to give you an example of this is Elizabeth Hikes wonderful book initiation she was a very um she was a, a sculptor and sort of an enlightened yogi master in the latter part of her life um but in the younger part of her life she was a renowned sculptor and during world war ii she and her husband had a villa and it was a big strong place and it provided great refuge for a number of families as the allies were closing in and bombing germany and one day she got this inner message that that she had to leave and she had to leave now and everybody who stayed the women were raped and the men were murdered and uh, and so it was pretty horrible for whoever stayed in the villa and she she and you know, half the people followed her when she got the message to leave and half the people stayed. And and so that's a case where the rational mind says, well, it's been safe here all along. We should just stay here. But the intuitive message said it's been safe, but it's not safe tonight. You you got to leave. You want to save your life. You're going to leave now. Hmm. It's a great story. And it, it um, parallels something that we talk a lot uh, about at Peak Prosperity called situational awareness. And uh, I think this is a great example of it. And a lot of people who have served in the military are particularly familiar with this, but it's just always having sort of a, a real-time beat on what's going on around you and, and not taking anything for granted and continually updating your assessment of what's going on. It sounds like you're saying, you know, clearly as things are shifting during a disaster, do that and uh, and listen to your gut as much, if not even sometimes more than your head, because you've, you've got some uh, evolutionary... Uh, uh, radar in there that's picking up on things that maybe even your conscious mind isn't that's correct yeah i totally agree with you on that now you got to distinguish between the voice of fear and this inner radar when the voice of fear will tend to flip-flop you know it's thinking this maybe you should do this maybe you should do that and it's going this way it's going that way it's going crazy when it's the inner radar telling you it's kind of steady and unwavering and it's not going to change its mind it it just simply knows so so you 
try to practice getting in touch with that because uh, you know if you listen to the wrong thing, they could just put you right into the to the jaws of disaster. All right. All right. All right. Well, here let's let's switch here to. Uh, I think I, I sidetracked you from talking about the aftermath. Um, you and I had joked before the podcast. You know, there's there's prepping and then there's posting, which is uh, after the uh, after the storm has happened. Uh, there's still a lot of things to be aware of. Some of which can can put you at great risk if if you ignore them. Um, let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, what are some of the key things people need to be conscious of, aware of, or focused on? Uh, you know, after the rain stops, uh, the clouds part, or you know, whatever the disaster is, after the acute uh, threat is gone, um, I, I know that you've written a lot about flooding and uh, and some of the uh, particularly nasty potential aftermaths of that. But what what are some of the things people should be most focused on? I'd say probably, especially with flooding, the, the two big things is going to be waterborne diseases and keeping yourself healthy in the aftermath and that people are stressed, they're often cold, they're wet, they're, they don't have the normal food they have, they have no, no normal comforts, and then the water supplies are totally polluted. And, and so you'll have raw sewage coming down the rivers and you'll have the, the public water treatments are polluted and not working. So having the ability to purify water for yourself and your family is super critical. And I, it's so important that I'd like to have multiple backups in my go bag. So I've got a um, a field serviceable water filter. I like the MSR and Katadyne ones that are backcountry standards around the world. And they have – they're field serviceable because they've got a, a, a carbon cartridge in the core and an outer ceramic shell in the cartridge and you can when they plug up you can take them out and scrub the outside layer off with a little scotch bright green scrubby and then put them back together and be going again and they'll filter out all the bacterial protozoa you know the protozoa and the bad bacteria out of your drinking water so you can stay healthy i like to have things on hand like um, a colloidal silver generator so i can make colloidal silver now two thousand years ago Alexander the Great didn't know anything about germ theory, but he knew that if he stored water for his troops in silver urns, then the troops stayed healthy. And uh, a, a soldier on the battlefield that's vomiting and having and 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 having diarrhea and vomiting isn't good for much. He's going to be a dead soldier, and keeping his his battlefield soldiers healthy was very important. It turns out that tiny charged silver particles have this almost magical property of being toxic to all known bacteria, all known pathogenic bacteria, but not toxic to the good probiotic bacteria in your gut. So apparently the extra thick cellular wall that protects your probiotic bacteria from stomach acids also protects them from the silvers that uh, penetrate the cell walls and kill the normal, um, the bad bacteria. Now, another big thing that people don't think about that much is mold, and toxic mold in flooding situations is is an extreme worry. Uh, I learned about this the hard way. In the early 2000s, I moved to Maui, and I was a green builder, and we had the bad luck of renting a home that had a toxic black mold infestation hidden within the walls. And the first year we were there was no problem. The second year was the wettest winter in 100 years. A whole bunch of Kona wind storms drove blinding rains onto the normally dry side of the island and flooded things out, including our half basement. And suddenly my wife started getting really bad migraines. And my mother-in-law came home one day and she's lying in the bed saying, I don't know what's going wrong with me. I can barely move. I feel like I'm dying. Well, it turned out she was dying. She didn't die, but she was close. And then my wife got sick and followed in her footsteps a few days later. And it was from this deadly black mold in the walls that the rains had brought out called Statubotrys. And we learned the hard way too that just we we tried cleaning it off of everything. We moved. But just bringing our stuff with us recontaminated the places we moved to. And once she was nailed by this mold, she was like a canary in the mine. Anytime she got around it, even things that wouldn't bother other people would just take her down. And uh, one of the side effects of this long term is cancer. And uh, nine, nine years later, she died of cancer. So she recovered 
from the mold, but she struggled with um, ongoing issues from the mold for the next nine years and then got a blood bone cancer and, and, and died from that. So this is an extremely serious issue and it masquerades often people it, it's like mold symptoms are not something like you got measles you can look and say oh he's got measles you know the mold is more like yeah you're getting migraines you know you have sinus problems continually you feel weak you feel nauseous uh, in her case, she started seeing these bruises on her body. It was really severe, and it looked like she'd been beaten with chains. And and uh, the doctors, she she said to the doctor, "Do you think mold could be doing this?" And the doctor said, "Oh no, trust me. You know, uh, this is a this is a Kaiser and Maui." And they said, "Oh no, no, mold can't do that." And then we're looking on the internet, and we saw pictures of Stachybotrys poisoning. And she said, "That's it. That's what I got." So we had to fly to. Oahu to find a mold specialist to test her and then he said yeah I called us up and said hey you got stachybotrys in the bloodstream really bad and uh, you know get out of the place you're in right now um, you know a couple of weeks from now uh, your wife will probably be dead because uh, the next stage after this hemorrhaging under the skin was brain and lung hemorrhaging followed by death so so this was uh, this is a really serious thing and and one person may be totally fine or appear to be fine, like it's just their system is strong and it's not getting it. And then maybe your kid is is getting it sick, or maybe your wife is getting sick. And so it's 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 insidious. It can it's very hard to diagnose. But know that if it smells musty, musty equals mold. And if you see mold growing on stuff, and if you've got a flood, you're gonna have mold. So, and I just published a. Uh, took an excerpt from my book, When Disaster Strikes, and, and published it on my website, When Tech Fails, today. So I've got some uh, some really good tips on recognizing mold and mediating mold and how to know if you've got to get a professional in there. But I'm just telling you, you know, pay attention to my wife's story. This mold thing is really serious and can cause long-term health problems and just totally take you down if you're not careful around it. Well, well. Matt, first, let me extend my deepest sympathies for what you and your wife went through. Um, it's a heartbreaking story, and uh, I, I, I'm sorry that your expertise has to be colored by that personal tragedy. Um, but if anything, I, I, good comes out of it, I hope that you're you, you're reaching people both through your own work and through interviews like this, uh, where you're putting that risk on people's radar that might otherwise not have known to look for it, and maybe helping people avoid getting placed in a similar situation. Um, we'll definitely link to that guide that you just mentioned about um, mold and, and how to you know look for it and, and defend against it. Are there any quick uh, big takeaways from that that you'd, you'd want to mention right here on the podcast? Um, yeah, it's if you're if you've been flooded, you're going to have mold. Okay, and, and sorry to interrupt, but you know we know that there's been I think close to a hundred thousand homes in Houston that have been flooded. So we know at right. least there there's a whole bunch of households, and probably a bunch more soon to be in Florida. So you're going to have to strip everything down to the studs and then treat it. And you don't want to do what the owners. This backstory in the house we rented in Maui was that the owners, a couple of owners back before the ones we rented from had gone on vacation in Bali for a month. And during that time, they had a sprinkler system in the house. Something set the sprinkler system off. And they came back, it was wall-to-wall -wall black mold. So they did the unlicensed contractor thing where they kind of stripped stuff down and repainted and cleaned up in new carpets and this and that. And everything seemed fine. But it was hidden there in the walls just waiting for another wet opportunity to really – burst forth. And the prior owner of the house had rent, had made the downstairs half basement his office. And after 13 months, after 15 months in the house, he fell dead in the toilet. He was found dead by his wife in the toilet. And so when we moved in, the, they were stripping and gutting the downstairs half basement. And the workmen said, hey, this is a real mold pit. And uh, I hope no one is going to live down here. And we said, no, it's just going to be our office and a guest room. And, you know, it was all cleaned up pretty and nice and new carpets and everything smelled fine. We didn't give it much thought because I've never dealt with that stuff before. So it's it's serious. It's It's got to be done right. If you do a halfway job, you've probably thrown all of your money away and it's going to come back and haunt you. It's got to be remediated fully. 
and you got to be really careful about saving furniture, saving anything. And some molds, if if the mold was making you sick when you're remediated, then you got to be really, really careful because there's still going to be some of it there. You got to use dehumidifiers, keep the humidity under 50% all the time to prevent it from coming back. I mean, it's a there's a whole bunch of steps on there that that we've taken, and and it's it's serious, and it takes once it's gotten a foothold in the house, it it takes a continuing nonstop effort to keep it from becoming uh, so serious that it takes your health down in the long run. And you might be fine with it for a year or two, and then you might succumb later on and, and not really even understand it's the mold doing it to you. Wow. Just in our last couple of minutes here, Matt, um, you know, one, I know that there's you know, just volumes and volumes of of advice and specific guidance that you give about uh you know, specific type of items to put in your 72 hour kit um, and, uh, you know, in your deep pantry and, and all the other you know, parts of, of, of your planning for uh, both uh, disasters, emergencies, but also just for resilient living. Um, and uh, we'll provide links to those on the site here because there's just not enough time in a single interview to go through all the material that you, you present in your various different works. Um, and uh you know we t we talk about um the, the 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 physical and material things that you can get in advance of a disaster um we we didn't address too much in this uh this podcast here uh the sort of more intangibles um it, things that we refer to at, at peak prosperity as social capital meaning um you know how you how you relate and interact and, and can be there in support of and ask for support from uh, the people in your community during these type of times. And uh, I think maybe that might be an interesting topic for a future discussion with you. But I did just want to flag it really briefly because I'd love to get your high-level thoughts about it, particularly because you you made that great comment earlier about um, tragedies uh, bringing out the worst in some, but the best in most. And um, you know what's nice is we, we certainly had an example of the former in the immediate aftermath of Katrina where, where things devolved so so quickly and so poorly there. Um, in New Orleans, but we've also seen in the case of Harvey, you know, many, many more stories of the latter where people were out there, um, you know, neighbor helping neighbor, uh, you know, great stories of, of heroism and selflessness and charity in terms of people, you know, rescuing neighbors and opening their homes to strangers and uh, you know, the Cajun Navy going out there and, uh, you know, saving uh, elderly people from flooded rest homes and it's just many, many, many examples. Um, uh, and also, it's it's interesting just to tack onto this. We did a podcast about a year or two back with Sebastian Junger, uh, the author of uh, A Perfect Storm or The Perfect Storm, uh, as well as a number of other books. And uh, one of the books he had written was after he had spent uh, over a year in Afghanistan in a hot zone with a, a U.S. Uh, platoon and um, uh, was just really taken with the um, the bonds that people form uh, under adversity. And uh, he ended up writing a book uh, called Tribe coming out of that, which, uh, you know, really talked about how we are fully expressed as humans uh, when we're operating, you know, amongst a tribe where, where everybody has everybody's back and, uh, and, you know, you're, you're, you're collectively existing to overcome some sort of existential adversity. And, uh, you know, I, I think, not that we ever wish for these disasters to happen, but uh, as you said earlier, these tragedies give us an opportunity to kind of bring out the best in ourselves. Uh, and in many ways, it's sort of how we're wired to behave. Um, so with all that, uh, anything on that topic of, of uh, being in service uh, to those around you during, uh, during these types of disasters? Well, certainly, I think the classic image of the lone wolf go it by yourself survivalist is is that most of us would not do well in that and most of those people if they're around others someone meaner and tougher and better organized will come and take all their good stuff cool stuff away so we do much better in groups and as and we can share resources we can watch each other's backs uh, no one can stay awake 24 7 it, we're much better in groups we're much more powerful in groups and um so if you have, you know, some people say, well, I just don't have any money for all of this stuff. 
Uh, but if you're young and stronger and you have skills, then develop, work on your skills. And other people say, well, maybe I'm older and I have the money for it, but I'm just, you know, I'm just not very strong. And so in that case, think about strategic partnerships. You know, who, think about teaming up with your neighbors in your community, you know, develop a network. And because that's really where the strength lies. And to be honest with you, I mean, I've got store food and stuff, but if one of my neighbors is starving, I'm not going to be able to say no to them. I mean, that's just unrealistic, <laughs> which means that my food probably won't last nearly as long as I'd hope it would. But and but my better have good foraging skills because when it's gone, if I need to, I'll be out foraging. But it's just let it, you know, think of it as an opportunity to be a part of a tribe, to be a part of a bigger, kinder, gentler world that hopefully will come out of this adversity. And I, I really do believe that the world, after all of this is said and done, when we pick up the pieces and put it together and get our, our world on a sustainable track, it will be a kinder, gentler more sustainable, more peaceful world. Um, what we go through between here and that point in the future, you know, how hellish it gets or how – or maybe we get smart and make the transition without having to be that bad. I don't know. But I certainly would love to be a part of that vision for a future where we're all working together for a sustainable, peaceful, wonderful world and, uh, you know, let the disasters be a part of heading for that vision. Hmm. We're very well said, Matt, and um, uh, I completely agree. And it reminds me of the saying that uh, – this isn't specific to, to, to emergencies of the type we're talking about, but just trials in general. But, you know, the saying says you, you can't control what happens to you in life, but you can control how you react to it. And uh, I think that's very much what you're saying, where, um, you know, we can't con we can't prevent these disasters from happening, but we certainly can um, control uh, our response to them and uh, use those as ways to improve ourselves and bring ourselves closer with those around us. Uh, so with that said, um, I, Matt, thank you so much for your time and, and for your expertise here. And I think it's going to be very directly uh, and very uh, directly relevant and practical to many of the people listening to this. Um, certainly our best wishes from Peak Prosperity to those that are facing down Irma and Jose and, and potentially even uh, uh, Hurricane uh, Katia, which is uh, formed in the Gulf now. It looks like it's going to be a very active year uh, just for uh, hurricanes alone. And of course, uh, yesterday, uh, I guess actually this morning we had the, the biggest uh, earthquake in 100 years in Mexico. So for whatever reason, it seems like Mother Nature is, uh, is, is trying to make our lives more interesting these days. But we, we understand that there's a human cost that comes to a lot of these tragedies, and, and our thoughts are with everybody listening here. Um, I'd also like to, to briefly reiterate that we're going to be linking to um, all the resources that Matt mentioned during the podcast um, I also want to remind our listeners that uh, we have a, a very robust, um, both disaster preparedness, um, but also sort of a general life preparedness uh, guide at uh, peakprosperity.com called the What Should I Do Guide. And you can access that at peakprosperity.com slash what should I do or peakprosperity.com slash WSID. Uh, one of the chapters in that guide is around building social capital of the type that Matt and I were talking about there near the end. So if you're looking for ideas on how to do that, that's got a lot of uh, specific uh, uh, best practices to recommend. Uh, and with that, Matt, um, I want to thank you again for your time. I'd really love to uh, have you back on the podcast again in the future and, and perhaps even in an upcoming webinar that's dedicated to general preparation and resilience where we can let our audience ask uh, direct questions of you in real time. Would you be open to that? Oh, sure. I'd, I'd love to be a part of that. All right, great. Well, um, I'm sure people will chime in, chime in in the comments and to their level of interest, but I'm sure it's going to be quite high. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Thank you again, Matt. And uh, Matt, we'll talk to you again soon. Oh, you're welcome. been a pleasure, and I like to close with my motto. And I ask everyone to do their best to change the world and do their best to be ready for the changes in the world. And thank you so much for having me on today. All right, Matt. Very well said, and a real pleasure to have you. Take care.